A few more things to note about Corinth. Corinth was also a clearing house for slaves in the eastern Mediterranean. It was part of a major slave route. Slaves were brought there and, and sold at, at market. So putting all this together, it means that one way or another, Corinth became a melting pot for many creeds and many cultures and attracted people from all over the empire. Not only did you have a major slave population brought there against their will, but you had a major population of willing settlers from all over the empire with all manners of creeds and cultures and idols and religions, and that's important, and we're going to look at that a bit later. So all of this means that Corinth is an exciting, happening place to be. It's attracting a lot of gold diggers, as it were, and uh, in fact, it's even starting to turn heads and draw attention from Athens to the east. Athens, the traditional uh, capital of Greece, and Corinth is now putting Athens' nose out of joint and becoming a bit too big for its boots, uh, as, it, as it were. Okay, we're now going to take things to a more personal level, and now we're going to put ourselves in the shoes of Paul himself, as he is coming to Corinth from Athens. So let's try to see Corinth and all that it meant through the eyes of the Apostle. And there on the map, a lovely glossy a picture of a map of, of ancient Greece, with Athens and Corinth highlighted. Now, Many scholars have tried to put together the most probable route that Paul would have taken in getting to Corinth, and it's interesting what they've come up with. Uh, as you can see, Athens in the east, and then, and then uh, Corinth some 83 kilometers to the west. One of the better <clears throat> articles that's come out is by the famed scholar Jerome Murphy O'Connor, who I quoted just now. Up until his death about five years ago, he was one of the top experts on Paul and his world, and uh, he wrote an article called The Corinth That Paul Saw, that St. Paul Saw, and I'm going to be drawing from that. So first of all, let's go with Paul as he approaches the city. Now, he's just left Athens, and uh, coming coming to Corinth now, Acts 18 says that uh, he came to Corinth from Athens, but it doesn't say how. It could have been via land or via sea. So let's have a look at each of these possibilities. Uh, first of all, if Paul had gone by land, he would probably have come the more treacherous route. As you can see, he would have done a curving arc over that that uh, area of Greece between the land part of Greece between Athens and Corinth. And uh, the last nine kilometer route, as you're traveling directly down, as you're on the Corinthian mainland and you're traveling directly down toward Corinth, it's given a special name, it's called the Scaronian Rocks. Uh, it was a, a ghastly place to want to travel on, on foot. It was too steep and rickety for, for roads, even the famous Roman roads were, were not built over that area. Uh, it was a precipice with, with a, a, a very rickety trail that went through. It was marked by precipices, by, by bandits. Um, in fact, it's, it's quite interesting that uh, Paul quotes or rather makes the statement in 2 Corinthians 11.26, I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. Uh, now, of course, this could refer to any number of things. I'm sure he was in danger uh, many times th throughout his his ministry and, and his life. But uh, it's interesting that several of the things he mentions here could easily have been experienced specifically on the way to Corinth. Specifically, he mentions rivers, bandits, and in danger in the country. And uh, interesting that, of course, this uh, quote is taken from one of the one of the epistles to the Corinthians. So it's, it's just possible that he might be fearing, at least in part, to this, this dangerous Scaronian rocks an area. Incidentally, uh, Scaron was a, a mythological bad guy, a mythological bandit. He used to force people to uh, to clean his feet, and then uh, when they'd finished cleaning his feet, he would kick them into the sea below. So not a very nice chap, and certainly not a very nice area. The Scaronian rocks uh, named named after him. Well, so much if uh, Paul had 
come by land, but what if he'd come by sea? According to Jerome O'Connor, Paul would have arrived at either Scoinus or Kencrei, two of the ports on the on the east side. If you uh, remember the the map we had up a short while ago, he would have arrived at either uh, Scoinus or Kencrei, and then he would have walked a few kilometres across down to Corinth, and there, the picture you have now, Port of Kencrei, that is what it looks like today. But if he had landed at Kencrei uh, by by boat, uh, that that is roughly the first sight you would have had of Corinth. If you just build it up in your minds, use your imaginations, that's obviously a bit of a ruin, but uh, if you build it up and imagine a reasonably bustling port full of people, that is roughly uh, Paul's first image and impression of uh, mainland Corinth. Uh, certainly, if he had come by sea, he would have been confronted by all the exciting sounds, sights and smells that we'd associate with the port. Uh, there's another scholar called Ben Witherington. He's done a uh, a very uh, good, uh, well-researched book called A Week in the Life of Corinth. And uh, basically it's a, a novella, a, a, a fictitious, well, uh, I, I say I use the word fictitious but very lightly, but a, a fictitious re-rendering of um, what uh, life might have been like for, uh, for Paul in, in Corinth, the sort of people he would have bumped into and met. And he also draws from a number of people that are mentioned in in the Gospels, uh, in, the, in sorry in the uh, in the new in the New Testament uh, elsewhere, and uh, at the beginning of his book, Witherington gives a very colourful description of the sort of thing that would have greeted Paul's eyes. Sailors just given leave were heading immediately for the dockside tabernae, uh, tabernae, uh, an inn, drinking hole. We get the word tavern from it. Roman soldiers kept watch over the toll collector's booth. As you can imagine, a lot of uh, trade coming coming in, and uh, it would have kept the toll collectors very busy. A garment salesman offered fresh tunics and togas to the dirty, disembarking souls, and prostitutes were hanging about with knowing smiles, hoping for some early morning business. Compared to the salty tang of the clean sea air, Nicanor, uh, Nicanor, by the way, is the, the hero of uh, one of the heroes of Witherington's tale, of Witherington's novella. In this story, Nicanor has just arrived uh, supposedly from, from Italy, from Rome. So this would be come, actually be coming in from the, the, from the west, uh, arriving at the west coast of Corinth. Nicanor was immediately struck by the stench that emanated from and hovered over the dock and shore. It was not merely the stench of those disembarking the boat, but the strong smell of sweating human flesh of rotting garbage and of the overripe scraps of seafood from the fishmonger's stall, even as he unloaded a fresh catch from a little boat not ten feet away. Clashing with that, and just as potent and pungent, was the smell of the small spice market across the way. There every manner of myrrh, frankincense, anointing oils, pisticnard and other fragrances were available. Some of the newly disembarked would head straight to the shop before heading inland. Knowing they did not have time to bathe or clean up, they chose to overpower their stench by hanging a little vial of nard or some other potent fragrance around their necks. Pistic nard was very expensive, the most expensive of the perfumes, and yet you would never know it on this day, as it was selling rapidly to the more wealthy of the newly landed residents and tourists. So this description then uh, probably fairly typical of the sort of thing that Paul would have experienced on arriving at Corinth, the uh, pungent smells, the smells of garbage, uh, the feel of life at a the feel and bustle of life at a port is uh, probably not not dissimilar to the sort of thing Paul would have experienced. Uh, in fact, we can even that apply that to much of, of human history, even in our own Middle Ages, and probably even Victorian London, we can expect something quite similar in terms of uh, smells, uh, sights, sounds, uh, that sort, that's a sort of thing. Right, no discussion of Corinth would be complete without discussing what is called the Diolkos, 
Now, the Diokos is one of the first things that Paul might well have seen, whether he'd come by land or by sea. And uh, what exactly is the Diokos? Well, we've just had a look at the Isthmus. We saw that the Isthmus was that narrow neck of land that joins the two uh, parts of Greece and touches the uh, either side of the Mediterranean Sea. Well, the Diokos, very simply, was a special paved roadway that ran the length from one side of the Isthmus across to the other. It ran from the west, uh, from west to east across the across the Isthmus, and if you look at the picture up there now, that is the Diokos as it looks today. Uh, it doesn't look anything special, but uh, in 50 AD, when Paul saw it, it was one of the most important thoroughfares in the ancient world. The Diokos ran between six and eight and a half kilometers across, and in fact, it served a special purpose. Now, we saw earlier on that uh, Travellers didn't want to take their ships around down the southern part of the Peloponnese because of the danger of, of rocks and shipwrecks. Um, and so you might ask, well, what did they do with their ships? Well, the answer is very simple. They dragged them across the Diokos, uh, six to eight and a half kilometers long. So in other words, the Diokos was used, one of the things it was used for was to transport boats. In general, it is thought that slaves were used to do the job, although it's possible that oxen or other animals were. Uh, one expert has calculated that it would have taken somewhere between 112 and 142 slaves, travelling somewhere around two kilometres an hour, and it would have taken them about three hours to drag one boat. Uh, to give a, an historical example, in 31 BC, Caesar Augustus had 260 boats dragged across the Diokos, and uh, you can try to imagine what that would mean in terms of manpower, quite staggering. So one of the first sights that greeted Paul's eyes may well have been the sight of over a hundred slaves groaning under the weight of a heavy boat, uh, taking it six to eight and a half kilometers across the, across the uh, span of the Diokos. Right, when Paul eventually gets to Corinth itself, a few kilometers to the southwest, what is the first sight that would have greeted his eyes? And there it is. That is a, a, a modern reconstruction of, of ancient Corinth, again, 2nd century AD, so possibly slightly different, but not too different from the Corinth that Paul would have, would have experienced. Uh, those are the main gates of Corinth uh, as they're opening. Uh, this picture is a still taken from a highly helpful video done by a very interesting group on YouTube called that call themselves History in 3D. Uh, they've done reconstructions of several ancient cities. Uh, they recommended uh, a very interesting work they've done. Uh, so as far as Paul coming in from the Corinthian coast is concerned, this is the first site that greets his eyes, as we saw earlier. Typical Mediterranean chalk white uh, facade very different from the piles of rubble and the uh, standing half standing walls that uh, you'd see if you visit ancient Corinth today. And uh, if you go, th if we have a look here, we'll see another one or two other pictures of, of Corinth. Again, uh, very Romanesque, a very Greek, very a very chalk white sort of sort of look about it. Right, so Paul has just come in on an 8.